All right, so this is uh, Justin Troop with TheEndlessWeekend.com. We're here today with one of my personal heroes, Tony Giles, author of Seeing the World My Way. Are you still in Greece, Tony? Yeah, I'm still in Athens, Greece, capital of Greece. I'm uh, here for another... Oh, I actually leave tomorrow, actually. Heading okay. back to the UK. So, uh, please forgive us if the sound's not perfect. We're doing this over the internet. And uh, one of the reasons that Tony is my hero is he's traveled all over the world. What are, how many countries are you up to now, Tony? Uh, 61, 62, and uh, all seven continents. That's amazing. So not only has Tony been to 62 countries and all seven continents, he skydives, he bungee jumps, and uh, for me, any of those things would be big accomplishments because it involves facing your fear. But on top of that, Tony's also 100% blind and 80% deaf, which creates obvious challenges. Uh, he also survived a kidney transplant in uh, 2008. In spite of those challenges, Tony chooses to travel solo. Right, Tony? Yeah, yeah, I'd, um, yeah I've done most of my traveling solo. Although I've now just started traveling with my girlfriend, who's also blind. What was your first trip that you did solo, and what was that experience like? Um, the first actual trip I did by myself was um, I was studying in the States, part of my uh, I did an American Studies degree back in 2000. And um, all my friends went to, uh, decided to go to Florida for the week for spring break. And I thought, oh, no, nah, this ain't going to work. They're not going to let me do what I want. So I decided to um, go to New Orleans by myself. And I, um, I got help uh, booking flights and finding the hostel, no problem. And, uh, you know, got to New Orleans, jumped in the cab and got to the hostel. But, um, so that was, that was pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And, and it was all just kind of like excitement, you know, what's, what's going to happen. And then I, um, I got asked directions to go down to like Bourbon Street, the main kind of drinking street, and walked out the hostel, walked down the steps and got onto the street and just froze. I just completely panicked. And I thought, I can't do this. I mean, a strange city i would never been to before. I'm on my own. I thought, oh, what am I going to do? And I just like, like my well, muscles went into like contraction and I was sweating like a bucket. And I eventually took a deep breath and I said, this is, this is what you, this is what you want. This is, this is what you want to do. You say, if you don't like it, go home. So I took another deep breath, turned left, walked down the street. And as they say, I never look back. And I, um, I described this in my, uh, in my book. I published a book um, last November. It's called uh, Seeing the World My Way. And it's available on, on uh, an Amazon, etc. It's a great book, by the way. I read the whole thing in about four hours. It got me very engrossed. <laughs> So anybody that hasn't read that should grab it. Um, yeah, and there's information available on my website, uh, www.tonythetraveler.com. So lots of pictures, blogs. So what do you, how do you overcome some of the challenges uh, solo traveling without sight? Can you give us a, some quick ideas of what some of that's like or, or, or how, what are some of the ways that you yeah. do things like keep track of your money or, or find your way around but some just – yeah. Basic stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I should say that um, when I was 10, I went to a very, very uh, good boarding school for blind and partially sighted kids. So um, I was taught the skills to use a, a long cane and um, how to eventually use a computer, first without speech and then eventually with speech. Um, and um, I got the opportunity to go to the, um, the States of the school when I was 15. So just the idea of basically um, learning to keep things in order, learning to memorize things. So, um, like, when you get money out of a, an ATM machine, a cash machine in the States, it's because the money's all the same size and the same color. But, you know, if you get 100 bucks out, it's, it's normally 520s. So it's just a case of counting your notes all the time. Um, if you know you've got 20s, 10s, 5s, try to put them in different places in your wallet. Or I, I often find the, the, uh, I fold the $1 bills kind of keep them in my pockets, things like that. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, when I was traveling around Africa in 2004, at one point I had about five different currencies on me, you know. And some of the currencies are in like millions and stuff. It gets quite crazy at times. It does, yeah. The exchange, exchange rates um, get really, really crazy. I, I noticed French, French Polynesia is a lot like that too in Tahiti. It, they have, you know, some of these countries you go in and you need like yeah. 10,000 
rupees equals a dollar or, or something. It gets really hard yeah, to keep track of. Yeah, Zimbabwe is like that and Mozambique. His, what kind of beliefs has all this travel given you about people? Um, well, yeah, it's kind of what a lot of people don't have to trust people, you know. Um, um, and, yeah, it's just quite refreshing attitude to the way that people have treated me for the most part. And, um, in fact, I've had people take me places. I had a guy in Mozambique take me home and, you know, I were walking down this dirt track, which is his street, and I kind of suddenly think, well, you know, he could say something in his native language and a bunch of guys come out and mug me, but... Yeah, nothing happened, and it was cool, and that's that's all part of the experience, you know. I mean, as a as a disabled person, you have to trust people to just to do the basics to help you cross the street, to give you good direction. So it's you know trust about different levels, and you start off on that basic level, and, and then build up. And occasionally it goes wrong. Occasionally people, you know, you ask them to take a photo with you with your with your camera, and they walk off with it. That happened in uh, that happened in uh, Sofia in Bulgaria, but. It's part of traveling. Uh, that, we all have to trust people. We all have to ask, you know. That's true. My my brother actually got himself uh, mugged in Athens, and he has all of his sight and hearing, and he still got himself mugged, you know, just because he made some yeah. made some wrong choices. But overall, right. overall, I found that people are good. I mean, they they. Yeah, you know, I, I've got no sight, and I'm I'm supposed to be really deaf, and I travel around the world. Yeah, I. The worst thing that's probably ever happened to me is I had everything stolen camping in the Yukon. <laughs> and that's just part of Those are some of the bumps in the road that, you know, every once in a while something happens, but it still isn't worth staying home and missing out. No, no, it's just part of the experience. You don't have to travel, you know. I don't have to go out and face the challenges, but it's um, special. It's magical. It is magical. What would what advice would you give to somebody that's always wanted to travel but has always been afraid to? Get off your butt and go and do it. <laughs> there you go. Good it's advice. It's about people. People say to me, "What well, you know? What what you need? How can you do it? If you can't see." But it's about it's about planning. So if you're disabled, you need to plan. You need to have an idea where you want to go. It's about being open minded and accepting that you need help. Um, and communicating with people. You need to talk to people. doesn't matter if you're disabled or not. If you're in a foreign country you've never been to before, you've got to ask for help. That's right, everybody. And the other thing, I mean, it's wanting, you're wanting that desire to, to discover and escape and to learn and to... the adventure. What, what kind of tips would you give people on making travel more affordable? Uh, you stay in youth hostels, you couch surf, like what do you, what do, you do to try to yeah, keep your cost down? Yeah, yeah, I stayed in hostels, camp surfed, um, I camped, I camped in Africa and Canada. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, couch surfing is the cheapest way. Couch surfing is fantastic, um, especially when it works. I couch surfed recently in, um, in Paraguay, and um, yeah, it's just fantastic. You know, you're meeting real local people, so yeah, you're getting actual, the real fabric of a country. Um, obviously, the, the, the occasional drawbacks with couch surfing is you don't always quite know when you're going to get to a place, and they don't always come back to you when you when you kind of want a couch. So it sometimes can be hit and miss. But um, no, when it's worth couch surfing, it's fantastic, and it's it's free. So yeah, it's free, and it's a, it's a way to also, like you said, meet people that are locals and uh, have local yeah. experiences. Yeah, and it's an exchange of culture and ideas, isn't it? And Absolutely. You can uh, save money lots of ways, um, do your own cooking. Um, I tend to only eat twice a day when I'm on the road. Um, and the main thing, as long as you've got water, um, then yeah, don't tend to worry about the rest. What are your favorite places to, in uh, like cities, to listen to? Is Bangkok's there... probably one of the most, probably it's still the most amazing city I've ever experienced. It's just kind of, when you, when you get outside the airport, you're just completely bombarded knowing well with sound smells and the fumes I mean the um, spices um, the chaos of the traffic and the police blowing the whistles and <laughs> uh, it's just a complete pandemonium and then on, on top of that you've got open drains and broken uh, pavement sidewalks and <laughs> smell of the sewer and the river it's just a whole cacophony of um, sounds and smells there it it's uh yeah sometimes third world countries or even second world countries can be pretty chaotic. I I was just in Thailand. I was in uh, PP Island for uh, a week, 
with my wife nice. for our anniversary, and um, I really love the Thai people. They're some of the most amazing people I think I've ever met. Yeah, yeah. I mean, South America is the same. Um, that little place called uh, Isla, Isla Negra, um, which is just up from Santiago, and um, basically uh, it's this hostel, like in the kind of the back of the town, and um, the lady who was owned it wouldn't let me wouldn't take my money to stay the night, and then she took me over to this other guy's house, and all these like 18, 19 year old kids just like hanging out and playing music and stuff, and that uh, was really neat, yeah, amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what it's about. And Brazil's like that as well. I remember. Um, Back in 2004, I had my last joint, sat on Copacabana Beach, watching the sun, well, feeling the sun come up and hearing the waves roll in, and uh, four or five of us just kind of sat on the beach. It's a crazy time. Yeah. It's awesome. A great city. Rio de Janeiro is just, yeah, party. What, what was it like to bungee jump in New Zealand? You, you, did, uh, you did several bungee jumps there, right? And I think the last one was almost a 500 footer? Yeah, it was about uh, 600 foot the last one in Switzerland um, but yeah I've done 12 so far 12 uh, of them and I'll, if I can find another one I'll do another one advantage I always say to people I can't see the bottom so the, the, <laughs> that's an advantage but everything keeps changing so you never know they keep building the bigger ones in um, in Queenstown so. oh just in Queenstown also I really loved it there neat place yeah yeah but one of the um, one of the things I recommend for people to do if they're into joining kind of sports is as well as bungee jumping, but a rocket bungee, and that's pretty, that's really neat. And you kind of get strapped into this ball, and then instead of like jumping down, you get um, propelled up in the air. And that's a real rush. <laughs> that's the reverse bungee, right? Yeah. Got and it. That's pretty, pretty awesome. And you can get to do that with someone else as well. So you can take your girlfriend or your wife. <laughs> how, is, uh, how do you think traveling has made you a stronger person? Minded, I think. I'm more accepting of myself and my disability. Um, more accepting of other people and, and other cultures. Uh, and the realization that um, I can't take anything for granted and um, that uh, I'm in a very pri privileged position. You know, you go to places like Africa, South America, and see the poverty. You see how people sometimes have to walk two miles every day to collect water, walk back from it. You know, we just turn the tap on, we don't even think about where it comes, and things like that. What would you like your legacy to be the world, Tony? Live life to the full. That's what I'm doing. I think you're doing a really good job of it, man. You know, I wrote a book. My mum's idea to kind of write a book to kind of like, you know, to show our friends kind of what I get up to and stuff. And then we kind of thought, well, hey, maybe we can kind of tell my story and, you know, maybe some inspire, inspire people to do whatever their challenge is, not necessarily say you have to go around the world and do crazy things, but just to say that whatever your challenge is, you know, whether, whether you have a, an obvious physical disability or, or a less obvious disability, you know, that anything, you can do it. Anything can be overcome if you, if you have a little help and, you know, a little desire to you know, try and achieve your goal. One of the things that I noticed in, the, in, in your book when I read it, I think it was towards the end, was... Um, that a moment of clarity for you was the moment that you realized that your blindness wasn't a handicap, that it was a it was an asset to you. When I was when I was nineteen and twenty, obviously I was kind of trying to come to terms with both my disabilities and, and being young and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't a case of just help me from one place to another and then go. And it was you know, actually hanging around doing things with me because I wanted to, because I feel I was. And and I also realized that my my disability, my personality. Um, open up more doors than they close. You know, things like jumping queues and fairground rides and with like being blind, I'm able to get a lot closer to people a lot quicker because they don't perceive me uh, as a threat, tend to drop their guard and things a lot a lot quicker. That's awesome. Well, listen, yeah. uh, we, we really appreciate that you uh, took this time with us and I, uh, you're inspiration to yeah, all of us, man. Thanks, man.